Gaudeamus omnes in domino, diem festum celebrantes, sub honore sanctorum omni. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. In the time between Series 2 and 3, we're exploring trends and themes in the history of the early Church. We're teasing out the concerns of various Church Fathers and the circumstances that called forth their great words and deeds. Among the great accomplishments of the Fathers is the development of the Church's calendar with its feasts and seasons. Today we're going to take a close look at one of those feasts, the Feast of the Lord's Baptism. Christmas has become the great monument to Christianity, or maybe it's the relic of Christianity that remains in the secular calendar. Christmas holds the attention of the world, from economists and presidents to shopkeepers and journalists. It's become Christianity's great public event. But it hasn't always been. In the early centuries of Christian history, other holidays had a greater hold on the piety and the imagination of believers. And the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord was one of them. In those days, there was no universal Christian calendar listing off the dates to be celebrated worldwide, so the local churches tended to situate their own feasts where they wanted them. In Egypt, it seems, the Feast of the Lord's Baptism was especially popular from very early in the church's history. Clement of Alexandria makes note of it toward the end of the 100s, the second century. He mentions that different groups celebrated the feast on different days, January 6th or January 10th. How did these Christians celebrate the day? They celebrated Jesus' baptism as a great revelation from God, a revelation of something essential to Jesus' identity and to the very nature of the Christian faith. Such a revelation is known in Greek as an epiphany, a manifestation, a showing or revealing of something that had previously been hidden. In some places, the church extended the meaning of the holiday to commemorate other similar manifestations of the Gospels. Commonly, there were four. Jesus' birth, the visit of the Magi, Jesus' baptism, and his first miracle. Since each of these was an epiphany, a revelation, the feast of these four became known as Epiphany. In modern times, we've come to associate Epiphany exclusively with the visit of the three kings. But the early church spread the love around. On the feast of Epiphany, the clergy were as likely to preach about our Lord's baptism as about his visit from the Magi. And how did those early preachers understand Jesus' baptism? They said it was the first of two baptisms that framed Jesus' public ministry. The baptism at the Jordan River was his debut, his opening act. Until he appeared amid the crowd of sinners and presented himself for baptism by John, his life had been hidden away in the village backwater of Nazareth. From the Jordan River onward, however, he would live an uneasy celebrity and he would himself foretell another baptism. He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am constrained until it is accomplished. And he asked his apostles, Are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? He was speaking, of course, not of a second water baptism, but of his baptism by blood in his passion and death on the cross. His first baptism, then, was an image of his second. It was an image of death. Yet it was also an image of birth, and the fathers made note of that. Jesus emerged from the waters, and the voice of God the Father announced him as the beloved Son, just as a human father might do when presented with a newborn baby. Well, birth always marks the end of one kind of life and the beginning of another. Jesus' days would no longer be as they were. They would no longer enjoy the anonymity of his mother's board and his father's workshop. He had been proclaimed publicly by God as someone extraordinary and also 
by the most esteemed prophet of his day. In his baptism, Jesus was publicly anointed, an action that marked the very identity of Israel's long-awaited Messiah. His anointing came not from any man, but from God. He was anointed by God's Holy Spirit, the Spirit signified by the dove descending from the sky and the water from which Jesus emerged. And this is important. The literal meaning of Messiah is the Anointed One. In Greek, the word is Christos, Christ, and that would ever afterward be used as Jesus' title. All of Israel hoped the Messiah would arrive as a Savior. St. Matthew tells us in the Christmas story that the Christ would save his people from their sins. And it is at the Jordan River that Jesus appears to the crowds as the Christ. Inspired by God, the men who wrote the Gospels invested this story with prominence. It's a central fact of Jesus' life, like his conception and birth and his death and resurrection. And the church very early followed the Gospels' lead by establishing a feast to commemorate the event. There arose a problem, though. The feast soon became a battlefield in the doctrinal wars that raged among the early Christians. The church suffered factions, heresies, that denied Jesus' divinity. The heretics said that Jesus wasn't really God, but rather just a very godly man, and they claimed to find their evidence in the scene of his baptism. Sweeping past the counter-evidence of the infancy stories, the heretics pointed out that Jesus apparently needed to be baptized. And what's with that? If he's God, he shouldn't need anything. If he's sinless, he shouldn't require a cleansing bath. They also noted that it is only then that heaven announces Jesus as a son of God. From this they concluded that it was at the Jordan that he became the son of God. So the heretics taught that the Messiah was not co-eternal or co-equal with the Father. He was not God by nature. He was just a creature of God, like you and me, and he was adopted by God into a special relationship, just as you and I are. If he is divine, he is not divine in the way that God is, but rather as a later development. In the early church, there were many different heresies that pursued this line of argument, and they achieved varying degrees of success in winning over the people. The earliest were called adoptionists. Later heretics were known as Gnostics, which means knowers. And one of the things that they claimed to know is that Jesus was not quite true God from true God, as we say in the Creed. The most successful heretics in worldly terms were the Arians of the 4th century, who managed to lure a number of emperors and even bishops to their cause. Remember that all these controversies were carried on in a culture that had no mass media. They were carried on in a culture where perhaps the vast majority of people could not read. So the doctrinal argument proceeded not so much by way of argument, by conversation, but by way of celebration. In ancient Christianity, the calendar was the great catechism of the church. It was in the feasts that the church most effectively taught the truths. The liturgy was the great teacher, the great conveyor of the apostolic tradition. And even today, people tend to learn the apostolic faith more from hymns, sermons, and prayers than from academic theology books. What did the apostles teach about Jesus Christ? What was the truth Jesus himself revealed to them? Well, what does the liturgy say? An ancient rule proclaims that the law of prayer is the law of belief. So the church continued to celebrate Jesus' baptism, but the focus of its celebrations shifted subtly. In the late 4th century, in the midst of the disputes, we find an increasing emphasis placed on the earlier events of Jesus' life. We find the church celebrating Jesus' birth with greater vigor. We find Christmas emerging for the first time as a major feast, celebrated on December 25th, promoted by some of the greatest of the saints, Gregory of Nazianzen and John Chrysostom and Augustine of Hippo.
It's not that Christmas was a new feast. It had been marked in Egypt on December 25th as early as the second century. But now it was given a new prominence, along with the church's celebration of revelation to the Magi on Epiphany. By celebrating Jesus' infancy, the church was teaching that the Lord had always been the Lord, that he had always been divine, that from the moment of his conception, he was God incarnate. Christmas increased. The baptism decreased. In fact, the feast of the Lord's baptism faded so completely that it eventually dropped off the Western calendar. It was gone for centuries and only restored recently in the mid-20th century by Pope Pius XII. In historical terms, that's hardly an instant. It's practically now. So you see, you and I are part of a great recovery mission. We are like Indiana Jones, bringing back neglected truths from the earliest days of Christianity. And why would we do that? Well, in the life of the church, those things always happen for a reason. Maybe this time it's because we need this feast as a corrective to some problems particular to our own time. If the 4th century had a problem with Jesus' divinity, maybe we have issues of a different sort and we need this feast as an antidote. The Arians were wrong about Jesus' baptism, of course, and the fathers of the early church pointed this out. Jesus wasn't baptized because he needed it, but because we need it. John at first refuses to baptize the Lord, and he says so. He says that Jesus should be baptizing him instead. Jesus does not deny what John is saying, but asks him to do his bidding in order to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus didn't need to be cleansed, but he knew that we need a model. We always need someone to show us what to do. That's why we have YouTube, right? So that someone with real expertise can show us how to change a tire, how to change oil in a car, or how to change a diaper. Well, Jesus doesn't just come and wave a magic wand to save us. He comes along and spends three years showing us how to be saved, how to change the polarity of our lives. And it all begins with baptism. The church fathers were adamant about this. The Lord in his baptism reveals to us the means and the meaning of our salvation. The means is simple. We are saved through baptism. Jesus makes this clear to Nicodemus. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And St. Paul spelled it out even more. Jesus saved us, Paul says, not because of deeds done by us in righteousness, but in virtue of his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. So our salvation is simple. We don't have to do it. Jesus accomplishes it in each of us by the grace conferred in our baptism. Baptism is the very practical, sacramental means of our salvation. But what is its meaning? That's what I think we're missing today, at least in part. And that's one reason why I think it's good that the Church is training our gaze once again on the Lord's immersion in the River Jordan. For Jesus, baptism was not a rite of passage as it is for us. He did not pass from sin to righteousness as we do. Baptism did not save him because he did not need to be saved. Jesus' baptism is rather an image in time of an event in eternity. It is a window thrown open to reveal to us the life of the Blessed Trinity in heaven. St. Mark tells us in his gospel that the heavens were torn open, torn open at the moment of Jesus' baptism. What a verb, torn open. And what did we see when the heavens were opened so violently? What was exposed to our view at Jesus' baptism? What was revealed to us on the Jordan's banks? We saw and heard and otherwise sensed the truth about the Trinity. We saw and heard and came to know that our one God is, from all eternity, a loving communion of three divine persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
This is not something we could have figured out on our own. This is something that had to be revealed by God in a startling and even violent way with the ripping open of heaven. This is the truth that would illumine everything Jesus teaches later on. It's what we mean, for example, when we say with St. John that God is love. We're not just saying that God loves or that God is always loving. No, we're saying much more than that. We're saying that God is love, perfect love, and any true love that exists in the universe is somehow from God and a gift from him. God wants us to love and be loved for others. Probably the single most repeated command of the New Testament is this, love one another. It appears more than a dozen times. But we need to understand what the New Testament means by love. Love is the life of the Trinity, and that's what we're given in our baptism. In the 4th century, St. Ephraim noted that at Jesus' baptism, the unthinkable happened, and the invisible, infinite, eternal Trinity was made manifest to human senses. To the hearing came the voice of God the Father, to the sight descended the dove of God the Holy Spirit, and to the touch came the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus' baptism reveals the Trinity to us, not just as data, not just as information or mere doctrine, but as life, as a life that we ourselves could come to share. Remember, Christ had no need of baptism. He had no need whatsoever. Why was he baptized? Watch me, he seems to be saying. Do what I do. He is, moreover, empowering the waters to do something entirely new something water had never before been able to do, something sacramental, something divine. Jesus did not need anything from the waters. Instead, by his immersion, he gave something new and special to all the waters of the world. In the second century, Clement of Alexandria proclaimed, for this reason the Savior was baptized, to sanctify all the waters. All the waters of the world. Remember those water cycle posters we all had in our classrooms during grade school? Well, apply that principle to the gospel story, and you can see that the molecules of the droplets that Jesus touched are still very much in circulation, and they're coming to a church near you. If we follow Jesus into the water, we receive something we don't have up to that point. We receive the life of the Holy Spirit. We receive adoption by the Father. St. Augustine pointed out that we too hear the voice of the Father saying, You are my beloved child. For the fathers of the ancient church, this is the great truth of our salvation. Jesus came to save us from our sins. But that's not all. That was just a prerequisite, a precondition for a greater gift, the greatest gift possible. He saved us from our sins so that we might share his nature. In the New Testament, St. Peter tells us this astonishing truth. Our God and Savior called us by his own glory and goodness, so that we may become partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. What can that even mean? It means that we are to start living God's life, not in heaven, but right now, by loving him and by loving one another. This is the gospel. This is the good news. The fathers dared to call this salvation by names like deification and divinization. We have become gods, they said. Around 170 AD, St. Irenaeus wrote, The word of God made himself what we are in order to make of us what he is. A little later, St. Athanasius said, God became man so that we might become God. St. Augustine said to the people he had just baptized, Let us rejoice and give thanks. We have not only become Christians, but Christ himself. Stand in awe and rejoice. We have become Christ. In baptism, we are born again, born anew into life in Jesus Christ. By grace, we share his life in the Trinity. We hope to live it forever forever. 
but we train to live it now over the course of an earthly lifespan, through the sacraments, and through our charity. If we think of Christianity only in terms of our own self-interest, then salvation is the most important thing, the deepest mystery of our religion, and our most urgent concern. It's important that we know what it is, and it is nothing less than the gift of God's own life, His own nature. If we're going to live His life and share His nature, I dare say we need to wash up first. And I must add that I'm grateful for this sacrament. St. Augustine once said, The Lord wanted to be baptized so that He might freely proclaim through His humility what for us was to be a necessity. That is what we celebrate on the day of the Lord's baptism, and it's what we must imitate every day. You and I were baptized in the church. On that day, Christ began his public life in us. We await another baptism of suffering that we pray will bring about our definitive birth to heaven. In between, we must live the life of Christ, the love of the Trinity within our world, and for that we should give thanks and give glory to God. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Way of the Fathers. If you did, I ask you to consider making a donation to help us. You can do so by visiting our donation page at catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. We're grateful for anything you can give. And remember, we pray for our benefactors every day. I thank you for listening. De quorum solemnitate gauden tangeli et collaudant Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics, including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman. You might also enjoy Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, devoted to works of high artistic caliber and Catholic interest. And for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, Listen to the Catholic Culture Podcast.